Welcome to our third annual Youth Vital Conversation hosted by the Victoria Foundation in partnership with Coast Capital Savings. So today we're focusing on youth financial well-being. My name is Zahara Ahmed and I'm the Grants and Youth Programs Associate here at the Victoria Foundation. And on behalf of everyone here today, I'm really excited to have you here and looking forward to the conversation that we'll be having together. So before we begin the event, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we are hosting this conversation today as the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen people of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. So as someone that's quite new to these lands, I'm very thankful for the opportunities, the peace and the guidance that they've offered me. Before we start the conversation, I invite you all now to just take a moment to pause, to reflect, to become fully present, and to think about why you're here today. I invite you all to approach this conversation in a mindful way with positive intentions. And I invite you all to allow the land to guide us toward positive actions and dialogue. I also invite you to reflect on the complex relationship between finances, the dominant financial systems here in Canada, and Indigenous peoples. We can't have a conversation about money and finances without acknowledging the complex history and the ways in which Indigenous peoples' uh, ways of being have been disrupted through these systems. Thank you. So for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Vital Conversations, I'd just like to provide a brief, uh, a brief background for your information. So the Victoria Foundation uh, hosts Vital Conversations every year to bring together different community members and to discuss important issues that impact our well-being. So for the past three years, we've also been hosting a Youth Vital Conversation in partnership with Coast Capital. So every year, the Vital Signs Survey um, is something that we put out, and this report that comes out of it helps us inform the topic of the conversation. So in the 2019 Vital Signs Survey report, 61% of youth under 30 indicated that the cost of living, including post-secondary education and housing, was a major issue, issue facing youth in Greater Victoria. So given all of this, this year's Youth Vital Conversation aims to explore financial well-being among youth. Today's conversation specifically is going to focus on youth around the ages of 15 to 21 and the new or existing challenges that they face in regard to the new job economy, the rental market, or post-secondary options that are going to be virtual. I'd like to thank Coast Capital for sponsoring this event and just being really wonderful partners to work with. They have really deep roots in our community and just this commitment to building the prosperity of residents in the region, making them just really outstanding partners for everyone here at the Victoria Foundation. I'd also like to acknowledge our amazing youth advisory members who've been with us every step of the way in planning and executing this event. So these members are really integral in making this conversation happen. So I'd like to thank wholeheartedly Tanya, Charlie, Divyesh, Megan, Ala, Jamila, Mark, Kamal, and Shaylin. So they're all here with us today virtually and they'll be supporting the conversation in different ways. Just a few logistics to go through. Our, our conversation today is going to go until 6 p.m. For the first hour and a half, we have an interactive panel conversation. Um, so we have specific questions that we are going to pose to panelists so we can hear from them. But we also have opportunities for you, the participants, to engage throughout the presentation. So I encourage all of you to engage with us through the chat uh, as one way. So two of our advisory members, Ala and Mark, will be asking everyone questions in the chat, and we'd love to see all of your answers and your comments. We also have a live Q&A where you can submit your uh, questions for our panelists. And we will also have moments throughout the conversation where I'm going to invite anyone who would like to ask uh, a question or comment out loud to raise their hand. So once you raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can use your voice to ask a question. But just remember that this isn't going to enable your video. So throughout the conversation, there will be plenty of opportunity for you to share. 
At around 545, we'll begin to wrap up the discussion. So two of our advisory members, Shaylin and Divyesh, are acting as listeners today. So they'll, they'll be listening for key takeaways and next steps throughout the event, um, and they'll have an opportunity to share that with us uh, during this time. Finally, we'll have Tanya from Coast Capital speak, and we'll wrap up the event at 6 p.m. So I'm really excited to share with you that this event has been very much youth informed and we want it to continue being very youth driven. So we do encourage everyone to engage with us through the chat and the Q&A, but we'll be doing our best to really prioritize youth questions and comments for the interactive portion of this program. So financial well-being, that is the topic for today. A good way of thinking about financial well-being is thinking about just the extent to which you can comfortably meet all of your current financial commitments and needs while also having the financial resilience to continue doing this in the future. So it's not only about income, it's also about having control over your finances. It's about being able to absorb a financial setback and it's being on track to meeting your financial goals, whatever they might be. It's also about having financial freedom to make the choices that you want to, to support your well-being and your quality of life. So as we begin the conversation, our intention is to create a really open, welcoming, and courageous space for tackling a topic that's often really difficult and also considered taboo. It's really important for all of us to understand and acknowledge the different challenges and opportunities that every person has associated with their financial well-being. And also just to recognize just the, the different experiences and relationship that youth have with money for a variety of different factors. And this, uh, this includes family supports, education, gender, race, other societal or community uh, factors as well. So as we delve into the conversation, I welcome everyone to think about how different parts of your identities have really shaped your financial well-being. And just as much as possible, be comfortable or just lean into that discomfort of talking about money, finances, housing, or any work challenges that you might face. So with that, I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. I'm very pleased to have with us four amazing individuals. Agul Kalile, the Manager of Engagement at RentSmart. Alicia Glover, the Executive Director of Community Micro Lending. Gavin Donatelli, the Youth Employment Outreach Coordinator for WorkBC. And Tanya Dodo, a recent high school grad, former intern at Coast Capital, and one of the wonderful members of our Youth Advisory. So we'll start this conversation by talking about people's relationship with financial well-being. So I'd, I'd like to ask all panelists to briefly introduce yourself and describe your relationship with money. Hi everyone, my name is Gavin Donatelli and I'm the Youth Employment Outreach Coordinator for WorkBC in Victoria and Saanich. It's my job to support youth between the ages of 16 and 30 to access WorkBC services in Victoria. For anyone who doesn't know, WorkBC is the primary government-funded employment service provider in BC. We exist to help people find meaningful and sustainable employment that meets their financial needs while also giving them purpose in their job. The main ways that I help youth is I support them to access WorkBC services, I act as an advocate for youth at WorkBC. I create WorkBC events and learning opportunities for youth. We just recently launched a virtual youth job club called Hired, and that's one new initiative. And I also connect youth with other employment programs and youth service providers that meet their needs. I personally didn't know much about money management until I was 25. While I've been working since I was 15, Unfortunately, I didn't put any money aside for later in life. And if I'm being really honest, I got into some credit card debt in university. So at 25, I realized I needed to educate myself about how to budget and save and invest and to have more money left over for the special things that I wanted out of life. By the age of 30, I'd saved enough money to go on a 10 month honeymoon with my partner and we had enough left over to move to Victoria 
from Winnipeg to this awesome but pretty expensive city. So one of my passions is to share what I learned with others to help them improve their financial situations. And in terms of my work, the key thing to remember is that WorkBC can help youth or just anyone in general over 16 gain financial stability through employment. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you so much, Gavin. Uh, we're glad that you were able to make that move from Winnipeg to Victoria and be here <laughs> Upgrade. with us. Upgrade, woohoo. <laughs> uh, Tanya, I, I'll ask you to share next. Hello everyone, um, I am Tanya and I was a 2019-2020 youth intern at Coast Capital Savings. Um, with the, that job, I was helping members um, throughout their journey of financial well-being, and I was working on the front line during the pandemic. Um, I'm also a member of the Youth Advisory, um, which helped plan this event um, to work to remove the negative stigma around financial well-being and just financial conversations. Um, this fall, I will be going to U of T to study business commerce. And personally, my relationship with money has been pretty comfortable throughout my whole life. I grew up not really talking about finances with my parents, but having a job at Coast Capital has really helped me grow a stronger relationship with money and have a stronger relationship with my financial well-being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I think like the experiences that you've had on your lived experience uh, will really add to the discussion that we're having today. So my, my next question for, for panelists is, why is it important to think about your financial well-being? And Alicia, I'm going to ask you to answer that question first. Thank you. Um, I mean, when it comes down to it, you're already beginning to form beliefs and patterns and behaviors uh, as it relates that will affect your financial well-being uh, now. <laughs> it's already happening. It's happened as soon as you became aware of the world. Uh, and you started to you know, see uh, what it took to get things, what it meant to not be able to get things, uh, and any other experience uh, that you've had up until this point. Um, and so the sooner you start to take like an active interest in an ownership over you know, what your financial well-being is, uh, you know, your, your money story, um, uh, the sooner you're able to step away from uh, the opposite. Um, because when you don't have ownership over that, you're leaving room for everybody else's fears, beliefs, agendas, uh, patterns, values uh, to creep in and shape how it is you relate to money and to work and, and what it means to have enough, what it means to actually be well. Um, you know, for, for a lot of people, uh, they go their whole lives um, making decisions that affect every aspect of their life based on other people's uh, beliefs and, 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 and patterns. Um, and thinking, you know, that, you know, later on, I'll, I'll worry about what my values are. Later on, I'll figure out what I want to do for fun. Uh, and, and yet, confused as to why they can, you know, they never feel like they have enough or they're doing enough or, or, or they're, you know, not doing something that lights them up. And so, you know, we operate from a belief that work and, and, and the creation of value, the exchange of that value, whatever it is you're doing, um, can, can line up with those values and, and help you feel fully expressed. And, um, you know, that directly relates to how you, uh, your beliefs around money. And so this, you know, the sooner you can shape your own, your own money story, uh, the more power you'll have to actually to make decisions that are in alignment with what it means, you know, with, with what you want to do in the world. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it acts as a wonderful filter um, because without that filter, uh, everything gets in. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia, for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think that that's a really important point to think about, you know, your, what's best for you and what, what you think versus what others are telling you and what society might be telling you. So thank, thank you for sharing. Uh, Gavin, I'll ask you to, to share next. And I think you're just muted, Gavin, sorry. Thank you, see, I knew I shouldn't have touched that mute button. Sorry, everyone. Uh, so it's important to think about your financial well-being because there's no better time to get a head start saving than when you're young. 
On the other hand, getting trapped in debt can be a lifelong battle. So avoiding those mistakes early before they happen is key. Uh, thinking about your financial well-being can help you target jobs that pay enough to cover what you want and need, as well as give you an idea of where you'd like to end up working and earning as you age. By earning more, you have greater financial security without having to give up as much. I know people hate the idea of budgeting. It seems boring and often to budget, you have to decide what you're willing to give up or cut back on to meet your financial goals. However, once you come up with a plan and you can stick to it, you get to do the fun part of budgeting, which is deciding like how I'm gonna spend my savings and that treats you for the discipline and you get to reward yourself. And that could be an iPhone, a concert, a car, getting your own apartment, going traveling, saving for school, or even investing for something huge like a home or retirement. When you're young, you have certain advantages that you might not have when you're older. You may have less financial responsibilities and you have more time to accumulate wealth and let it grow. You can also learn skills to stretch your money and make it go further, giving you more of what you want without the full price tag. Because there's lots of people that pay full price for everything. And unfortunately, they're getting hustled a bit because usually there's a discount on almost everything. It just involves some sweat equity and figuring out how to find those wrinkles in saving. Um, so there's no better time to start saving or figuring out the system than now. I wish I had started 10 years earlier. Thanks so much, Gavin, for sharing. Yeah, there's definitely a system to figure out. Um, and the more you know, we talk about it and look into it, the easier it can get. So Tanya, I'll ask you to go next. Why is it important to think about financial well-being? Um, so spe specifically, um, people that are just graduating high school or graduating school in general and moving on to the next chapter of their life i definitely think it's important to think about your financial well-being because um for example i am going to go to university and i'll have more independence and i'll be moving away from my parents financial security so i need to know what my financial well-being means and I need to figure out how I'm going to pay for things like tuition, whether I'm going to go live on residence and my expenses like groceries and utilities and just entertainment everyday expenses. So that's definitely something I need to start thinking about. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, it sounds like you're at this um, transition point in your life where it's bringing up a lot of these questions um, for you to think about and, and talk about with others. So thank you for sharing. Um, I go, I'll ask you to go next. Um, it's important to start thinking about your financial well-being now, um, earlier rather than later. First of all, because um, financial insecurity is linked to um, mental health too, right? So you stress about not being able to uh, um, to, have, to meet your financial responsibilities, worrying about money, uh, that causes a lot of stress and um, mental health issues. And on the other hand, financial freedom gives you, gives you the, um, the opportunity to make choices in your life, to follow your path and fulfill your passions. And if you plan in advance and budget and learn all these skills to meet your um, expenses, then you have that freedom to think about the things that you really enjoy, the things you want to achieve in life and fulfill yourself. And some of the, th some of the uh, bigger things that are at stake, like your housing, um, the well-being of your loved ones that you're supporting, all that it becomes, uh, be becomes something you can lose if, you, uh, if you're in a financially insecure position. So, um, it's really important to plan ahead and budget and um, start earlier. Thank you so much, Yuval, for, for sharing that and just kind of the insight for things that come up in life that you might need to plan for. Um, so we've heard now from all of our panelists on these two questions, and I'd like to kind of ask any participants who'd like to share 
um, to share with us now. So we'd like to hear from you about your relationship to, to money or financial well-being and why you think it's important to think about financial well-being. So if anyone would like to share that, please raise your hand, click the raise hand button on Zoom, and we can unmute you so, so that we can hear you. So I'll just give it a couple of seconds to see if there is anyone. Okay, Charlie, I think I see you. Would you like to say something? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, my relationship to money and financial well-being hasn't been super eventful so far because um, my parents have a fairly secure financial situation and it hasn't really been something I've had to think about. Um, so I am guess I'm here because I'd like to figure out how to like imagine it in my own life and like what kind of things I can do for myself so that I'm not like gaining from my parents, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, thanks for sharing. So it, it sounds like there's, you know, again, you're at this stage in life too where you're starting to think about how things might change for you. Um, and so that, that's great to hear. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, I think we have Kamel here to share as well. Please go ahead, Kamel. Uh, hi. So I basically think that the financial well-being is so important because, you know, everyone wants to provide for their families or for themselves and plan for the future. And uh, one thing that I recently realized is that it's not about how much money you make in most cases. It's about how much you plan for the money you actually have. So not necessarily making more money is going to lead to you saving more or getting your goals. Uh, so basically, yeah, that's the main thing I learned. And also, because I want to control my day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month finances. Also have the ability to, in case if I have any financial shock or any emergency, I can control that or absorb it. And obviously to meet my goals, like now I'm 26, so now I'm planning for the next few years, you know, to purchase a house and whatnot. So these require planning. Uh, so basically that's why I believe it's really important to, to learn more about your financial, uh, financial well-being and plan for it. Thank you, Kamel, for sharing that. Yeah, it sounds like that that planning part part of it is so important, um, and to be able to absorb those financial setbacks. So, thank you. So, we actually had a couple of questions um, submitted to us through the live Q and A, and I think that we've got two of them answered, and one of them hasn't been answered. So, I'll ask that one and see if anyone could um, speak on it. What would you recommend for resources for, for medical plans for youth and transitioning out of your parents' plans? So that's a bit more specific. Um, so yeah, medical plans, transitioning away from your parents um, and how that might look. Do any of the panelists want to speak to that? I could add just one thing, if you're looking for employment, you might want to target a job that pays benefits. Um, often I've heard a figure thrown out there that if a job has a good benefit plan, you might want to take the wage that's being offered or the salary and add about 10 to 15% more onto that. That's the value of a really good benefit plan. I used to work for the Boys and Girls Club here in Victoria and the pay was okay, but the benefit plan was amazing and that had so much more value because that plan was able to actually cover myself and my partner. So that's one suggestion. Thank you so much, Gavin, for sharing that. That's, uh, that's important to know. Does anyone else want to speak to that before we go to our next question? Uh, I'd say, I mean, that, yeah, absolutely. I second what Gavin says, and I'd say if you, but if you are having a, a tough time finding a job with benefits, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of folks who are relying on part-time work or gig work, uh, that's definitely a barrier. So I would talk to your credit union uh, or, you know, set up a, a relationship with a credit union that has um, plans for 
self-employed people. Uh, they do exist. <laughs> so, you know, talk to, to somebody who's, who is in the know and, and, you know, figure out what your options are. Thanks so much, Alicia. Um, so we, we have another question um, that's been answered, but I might ask uh, Agul what you might add to this question. The question is, how much money would you say is needed as a minimum account amount to have before moving out and starting to rent? I was just typing an answer to it, but I'll, <laughs> I'll say it uh, live. Um, yeah, I agree with G Gavin, but sometimes um, um, it's like realistically, sometimes you absolutely need to move out. Either you're going to college or you know, you're in a situation where you need to uh, start renting and you don't ha necessarily have a, a, you know, a few months worth of savings to do it. It's important to consider other expenses apart from the monthly expenses that Gavin uh, um, indicated, which includes the security deposit, the moving expenses, and the utilities that you will need to pay if you're starting to live on your own and moving out, um, uh, you know, uh, your family household, for instance. So having a good plan is a great idea. Just sitting down and uh, writing down all the possible expenses uh, would really help. Perfect. Thank you so much, Will, for, for sharing that. And just uh, for everyone's information, if you do click on the live Q&A, you'll be able to see uh, the questions and you'll be able to see answers that um, panelists have put there too. So if you want to read through that at some point, please, please go ahead. So we're going to go into the next part of our conversation now. Um, and we're going to speak on how youth are supporting their financial well-being at this time. So my question for, for everyone on the panel is, what advice would you give youth at this time to help them think through their financial well-being? And for those of you that are representing organizations today, what services and information does your organization provide to support youth? And Gavin, do you want to start us off with that one? Sure. Uh, so unfortunately, COVID has hit youth hard with higher rates of unemployment. In June, youth unemployment in BC was 29.1%. So my advice to youth, if possible, would be to try to get into the job market now. Once the CERB and other government financial supports run out, there are going to be a huge number of job seekers looking for employment. Businesses are continuing to rehire and there's more employment opportunities opening up. For example, in June, BC added 118,000 new jobs. And on Friday, WorkBC put out a list of eight pages of employers that are hiring in Victoria. So if you can beat this rush of people that are trying to get employed, it'll give you a large advantage. And it's always easier to find a new job when you have a current job. Earning money now can help you avoid building up debt, and it puts you in a better position to be promoted or potentially to receive a raise as business prospects improve. Also, working during COVID demonstrates your resilience and will help you improve your skills of being adaptable and flexible, which are really two of the most important qualities employers are looking for right now as they try to deal with this ever-changing environment. WorkBC is here to offer supports to help you find employment. So that can be helping you create or enhance your resume, helping you uncover your transferable skills, teaching you job search skills. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but only one out of five jobs is actually posted to the public. 80% of all jobs never get posted. That's the hidden job market. And we can teach you the skills that you need to access those jobs. Finally, we can teach you interviewing techniques. This is especially important right now because interviews have now become much more virtual video chat or over the phone and learning some techniques to prepare and be, feel comfortable on camera can really help you shine. Overall, all these skills are really important because before COVID, Victoria had the second lowest unemployment rate in the country which means that as a job seeker, it was relatively easy to get a job here. 
that reality has changed now and there's much more competition. So if you can access our expert team to give you advice, it'll help you get to the front of the pack. We also stick with you for one year after you're employed at WorkBC. So if you're having trouble on your job, you can reach out to us for suggestions. Or ultimately, if you're like, this is not the right job for me, we can help you look at other employment opportunities. In August, we're gonna be launching a youth-focused financial and career planning course called Fortune Teller, where you get to estimate the costs of the life you wanna have and then do some career exploration to see what kind of jobs provide the salary you would need to be able to afford that kind of life. WorkBC is also able to provide various kinds of supports to eligible clients for transportation, job starts, training, and more. This can help you save money while you're looking for work. Thanks. Thanks, Gavin. Um, yeah, great mentioning that uh, hidden job market. That's that's like a that's a big one, and there's so many opportunities there. But just how do you get there? Um, so I guess that's a follow up for you for anyone that's interested. Um, next, I'll ask Tanya to answer this question. What what advice would you give to other youth at this time, Tanya, to help them think through their financial well being? Yeah, specifically um, my younger youth out there um, that are in high school, I would definitely say open up a bank account because some of my friends, I know they don't have a bank account yet. Um, and then find a financial institution that um, aligns, lines up with what you need as a youth. Um, so it lines up, it targets towards youth because you don't need to stick with the same financial institution that your parents have. I know that I thought that until I found a financial institution that really felt, that really targeted towards my needs and my values. Um, and yeah, and then start creating and building relationships with your financial institution, which will be helpful in the long run. Um, for example, in my experience, when I first opened up a bank account at my new financial institution, it was a bit intimidating at first, but then I booked an appointment and I went in and I was treated like the young adult that I was. I wasn't treated as a kid. I was treated as the young adult that I am. So it's going to be very rewarding in the long run. Thanks so much, Tanya. I think it's good to hear kind of what your experience was through that and how, how it helped you. So thank you for sharing. Um, I'm, I'm also just looking at some of our poll results now. Um, and when we ask the question to participants, what statement best describes your financial well-being? Uh, we've had, we had a lot of participants say that, you know, they feel somewhat in control of their financial well-being. Um, and in terms of the support that they are getting um, for their financial well-being, a lot of people have indicated their parents as support, but we do have a few individuals that said that there's no one right now that is providing the support. So keeping, keeping this in mind, um, Agul and Alicia, I'm going to ask you to answer the same question too. What advice would you give youth at this time to help them think through their financial well-being? And for your organization, what services and information are you providing? Um, Agul, I'll start with you. Um, because uh, I represent RentSmart and we do tenancy education, I will speak more about renting. And um, I think renting is, is, a, is a very important aspect of our lives. And um, many of our participants uh, are probably considering renting, to, uh, starting to rent at some point or um, moving out from their family household. Uh, family household. And uh, what we learn with our participants is that a lot of people are um, rarely have the renting skills like they they don't it's not an innate skill renting and it's a skill that is learned and so um, not knowing the not having the right skills and the right mindset can lead to uh, problematic situations and really stressful situations um, uh, my daughter recently started playing minecraft and uh, 
I, as I was trying to learn the game with her, I realized, oh, wow, this is so like real life. It gets dark and if you have no place to go to, then you know, you're know you all alone in the dark, right? So it's the same, like you want to have a safe and secure home. You want to have a good relationship with the person uh, who you're renting the house from because you're not, so that you're not constantly stressed coming back home knowing that there's an argument or there's a conflict. But what uh, the things that we're not prepared for when we enter into a tenancy is that tenancy is actually a complex uh, contract and it's, co it's governed by legislation. So there are rules that we need to learn before we enter into a tenancy agreement and we need to know our rights and responsibilities. But we also need to work hard on the relationship with the landlord to have a healthy and good relationship. And those and are the trainings that we provide, the Rent Smart courses, they teach all these aspects of a tenancy to have people uh, more prepared and more confident starting from the beginning when they're first uh, first looking for um, their house for a place to rent and they're uh, making an application they're going to viewings and make a meeting with the landlord and particularly with young people unfortunately what we hear is that um, landlords tend to um, not have as much trust in younger people rather than uh, uh, older adults uh, you know they tend to think oh you know you're if you're young you're going to be too loud and you're going to make a party right so uh, some of the things we teach is for example when you're going to a viewing please uh, prepare like you're preparing for an interview prepare to make a good impression on the landlord uh, dress up for the occasion and then um, uh, prepare all your paperwork, uh, uh, make a checklist of everything that you will, uh, that uh, you know is required for, by, uh, is required by landlords. And we teach all of that in our courses. Um, and, you know, if, uh, like, if we have the briefest of time with our participants, the three things we like to tell the participants to remember about tenancies, to have a successful tenancy, and this is the term we use a lot, successful tenancies, because this is, um, this is what we believe leads to a stronger communities, to a better well-being. Um, and so for, to have a successful tenancy, the three things, the, abs the minimum three things that you need to remember is paying your rent in full and on time, taking care of your place, and being respectful to uh, the landlord, to your neighbors and your roommates. Uh, uh, so we offer our courses in Victoria. Before COVID, we used to offer public courses in our office. So anyone could drop, uh, well, we had a schedule of courses roughly once every one and a half month and people could sign up and come and take the training. We also have the online course and um, it's been gaining popularity ever since COVID happened. So we, we started noticing that um, many people are signing in and taking the online course. And we've also tried to move the in-person course to some format of virtual learning. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning more about how to prepare for a tenancy, how to succeed in a tenancy and have a good relationship with, um, with uh, your landlords, your roommates and your neighbors, uh, just uh, reach out to us to Rent Smart Education and Support Society and we'll be able to help you with that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yuval. That was some really good information you provided on, on renting. Um, Alicia, can, do you want to share next what your advice is and kind of what your organization is providing for youth? Yeah, I, and, and just before that, I guess, I guess <laughs> the advice, you know, what do you tell folks to help you think through your financial well-being at this time? Um, that first part, so I mean, it's, it's you know, as Gavin laid out with the statistics, just to, to, to ground this conversation in, in what's going on outside of this, you know, we are having this chat in the context of, you know, a, a massive economic disruption caused by a global pandemic. And uh, it's, it's having a, you know, it's having an effect on, on communities that have been historically underinvested in. And so that needs to be named. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people, uh, those impacts uh, are are pushing them into stress and and to to money being about survival. And so I I just want to name it for a lot of folks right now. It's it's difficult to think about well being uh, when we're we're in a crisis. Um, and I and I say that not to freak us out or depress us or be that person in the room who's like, 
bad news. Um, but because uh, just to ground any conversation now about opportunity and innovation that, that is possible right now, and, and a lot is possible right now, um, you know, work as we know it has been disrupted. How we do things has been massively disrupted. And, uh, you know, many skills that were, um, you know, not as valuable or suddenly extraordinarily valuable right now. And so familiarity with technology or, digital anything, um, you know, communicating through a computer or mobile phone or whatever it is, uh, is, is a core skill. Uh, and the capacity to do that well uh, is, is valuable right now. And so, um, so, so to step back a little, my advice would be, you know, get really, really curious about how you're reacting and the people around you are reacting as it relates to work uh, and money and paying the bills. Uh, things are amplified for everyone. And so, you know, back to that beliefs conversation and, and you know, getting clear on what your money story is, um, you know, this is a great time to be checking in with, with yourself and the extent to which your beliefs and what's causing fear or stress or confidence or whatever it is, uh, is, is truly, you know, where did that come from? Um, so, so I think number one piece of advice is be curious. Uh, and number two, is to don't undersell yourself. Um, I, somebody asked earlier, uh, you know, it's how to, to not just start at an entry level job. And uh, I think especially young people who grew up using, you know, digital technology, you're, you're well positioned to enter a workplace and advocate for yourself and ask for what you need and add value very quickly. And for that value to recognize more quickly uh, as folks who did not grow up with that uh, are, are seeing other challenges um, and, and needing support with that. So um, it may feel, what may feel natural to you is, is really a strength. And the third piece is just to be open to, to your career path having many different iterations uh, and, and to um, examine any beliefs that like, okay, I need to do this before I do that. Um, the number one thing my Bachelor of Arts degree <laughs> taught me, even though I tacked on a professional certification because I was like, this is going to be my career, uh, is that, you know, ultimately what it taught me was the capacity to learn uh, and continuous learning and how important it was if I was to uh, continue my journey as, you know, and my career as I, I was defining it, uh, was relying on like how quickly I could learn new skills. Uh, and, and, and try new things. Um, so we're likely going to see a ton of uh, micro programs, micro skilling opportunities. So chances to get certified in a certain software or uh, pick up a construction skill or, or skills that will help you quickly enter industries that may not have been uh, in your viewpoint up until now. Uh, and I encourage you to take those, even if you're not entirely sure what you're gonna do with it yet. Um, and so lastly, as it relates to what we can offer is um, we have three cohorts of uh, entrepreneurship training programs coming up in the in the fall. Um, and uh, one of them is explicitly for, actually two are explicitly for youth. So one is for youth uh, newcomer youth uh, in partnership with Verks, and, and this information will be shared after the webinar. Um, the second is uh, for youth who self identify as having challenges with mental health. So that will be starting up in October and we'll make sure you have information about that. Um, and then the third is for, for anyone of any age who self uh, identifies as having a disability. So those programs will walk you through uh, the tools to begin to, to, to build and test uh, your ideas um, and either create a job for yourself or, or uh, launch an idea, um, you know, wherever you're at in, in this, in this, in your journey to, to bringing your idea to life. Um, they're all free uh, and uh, two of them at least come with uh, startup grants. So, uh, you know, we, we're more interested in seeing people uh, take the steps towards, you know, testing out, uh, you know, what it is they want to do next and, you know, trying to, to lend them any money. So <laughs> they are, those things are also separate. Um, yeah. And then if, if, uh, if, if a cohort uh, model, like a full program is too much of a stretch, we're also, uh, we'll be doing one-off workshops and asking expert sessions over the next year uh, just to help people um, try out or, or get a taste of what it means to, you know, build your own career, build your own job. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and test you know try on what it means to, to be an entrepreneur and small business owner thanks thank you so much Alicia I think yeah you've made some really good points about those skills that 
um, youth have and just being able to use those skills in different ways and not, you know, just, and feeling really confident in those skills and knowing that with those skills, you can do so much and you have so much to offer. Don't let other people think that you don't um, because, because you definitely, definitely do. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I now want to go into some of the questions that came into our live Q&A. And I'd also like to ask participants who want to share a comment or ask a question out loud to please raise your hand um, and we can unmute you shortly. So one of the, the questions, um, well, first, one of the questions that came up was, is Work BC free? It sounds too good to be true. And, and Gavin shared that it is free. And I just want to share that, you know, some of the most of the services that RentSmart offers and community micro lending offers are also free. So take, take advantage of those. Um, another question that came up is, are landlords able to raise their price because of COVID? And Agul, I, I know you typed it in, but do you want to quickly share your answer to that one? Sure, yes, I accidentally clicked to answer live uh, because I'm also learning this new Q&A function. Sorry about that. But yes, um, as I said in my answer right now, while the government um, uh, announced the emergency situation. During the emergency situation, landlords cannot raise rent as well as they cannot evict tenants for non-payment of rent. Uh, they can, they, however, they can evict for other reasons, but uh, not for non-payment of rent. Uh, this does not mean that tenants are, are, you know, don't have to pay rent anymore because once this situation is over, they will still owe all this money for the past few months that if tenants weren't able to pay. Uh, so we strongly encourage uh, tenants who are renting right now, if they have the money to continue paying because the debt keeps growing. And once the emergency situation is over, we're not sure what's going to happen. The government is working on a plan to make sure that, um, you know, tenants, uh, will not end up on, you know, will not end up losing their housing or in a precarious situation because of this. But uh, it is important to remember because, um, you know, you might think that I'm not going to be affected, I don't have to pay, but it is important to remember that you still, you will still owe, the, the tenants will still owe the rent that hasn't been paid over the past few months. Thank you, Agul. Uh, another question that came up in our uh, live Q&A is, do you have any tips on how to talk to your boss if you are getting underpaid? And this person hasn't been paid for some of their shifts um, and feels uncomfortable at the thought of talking to the boss about that. So does, do any of the panelists want to speak to that? I can take a shot at it. First of all, I'd like to say I'm sorry that that's happening to you because that's a really awful feeling and I can understand your reservation about approaching your boss about it. People are nervous in that position and there's a bit of a power difference. Um, the first way that I would try and tackle it is I would really go over whatever records I had so checking pay stubs if you write in a day planner like when you go into work just looking at your hours when you were there and maybe even getting somebody else to look it over for you someone you trust just so you have a really good idea whether you're right and exactly how many hours you haven't been paid for and that way you can write it out and have a really clear idea of what shifts you're missing and how much money you're owed and then if it were me, I would approach my boss in kind of a positive way first and talk about how much I like working there and kind of remind my boss what kind of value I bring. You know, like I really enjoy engaging with the customers for these reasons. And it's, it's a little bit of a buttering up process uh, to put your boss in a better mood. And then I would probably approach it as, oh, I think there might be a little bit of a mistake. My records show that I'm actually supposed to be paid this amount and then either hand them those pay subs or have your records really clearly laid out and allow your boss that space to say, oh, shoot, actually we meant to pay you because it totally could be a misunderstanding. 
if you and your boss don't come to terms, then you have a larger employment standards problem uh, because it's illegal for your boss not to pay you for work. Um, and then that would need to be escalated. And I'm not an expert. I think the province has an employment standards branch that you can reach out to. And there's a 1-800 line. And uh, I try and help any youth that reaches out to me. Um, so even though it's not my expertise, if you wanna reach out to me later and get that phone number because you end up in a situation like that, by all means reach out to me and I'd be happy to research like what other resources exist for you to assert your rights. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Gavin. Does, does anyone else want to speak to that um, or have anything else to offer for that question? Okay, thank you. Oh, Alicia, yeah, yeah, you unmuted, go ahead. I was just gonna second Gavin, that was bang on, and, and uh, I, he offered some really good advice for difficult conversations generally, especially if it's with someone who uh, is in a posi position of power over you, is, is like the spirit of helping, and even just that can shift your mood and how you show up and uh, you know your power in, to converse and, and ask for what it is you need. So um, if you do feel you're, you're getting stuck in that, like, uh, it's, it's okay, like, I'm, I'm going to help them with this information. <laughs> uh, and then, and then just gathering the facts from there. Uh, so, yeah, great, great advice, Gavin. Totally, thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, yeah, just viewing it as, yeah, helping instead of, you know, bringing something up that might be destructive or bothering someone. It's, it's not that at all. It's helping them and helping yourself as well. So thank you for sharing that. So as we move into the next part of our conversation, how youth are accessing information and services on financial well-being, I'd like to share some poll results again from the questions that we asked in the beginning. Um, and so one of the questions uh, was who is your main support for financial well-being? And I, and I shared this already, but I'll say again that most participants um, say that parents or other family members right now are their main supports. Um, and there are a few participants saying that no one at this time is able to support them. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well, you know, that not everyone has that support um, and isn't able to easily access this sort of information. Another question we asked is, how are you um, wanting to currently access your information about finances? And a lot of, most participants answered that they want to access this information online or through some sort of website. Um, so, so that's some, some important information that we've captured um, to, and please keep that in mind. So now I'd like to continue engaging our participants, um, especially the youth on this webinar. So my question for you is, how are you learning about financial well-being and who is supporting you? And is this even happening? So if you'd like to share something, please raise your hand um, and we can unmute you so we can hear your answer out loud. Otherwise, please type your answer into the chat box. Again, the question is, how are you learning about financial well-being and who is supporting you? Also, is this even happening? So I think we have someone who would like to share out loud. Um, or maybe not yet, sorry about that. Charlie, I think you have your hand up. Would you like to share? Sure. Um, I'm mostly getting my support from my parents. Um, my mom goes through my pay stubs with me, and she's done that with both my siblings as well, um, which is super helpful because um, it can be kind of a nuisance to have to do, and having her telling me to do it is um, very helpful. Um, but other than that, I, I only have what's in her experience, um, guiding me for what I should be doing. So yeah, it'd be interesting to have access to other sorts of resources besides, um, my mom who I live with, who is 
also like obviously very helpful, but um, one only one perspective. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, I think it sounds helpful to go through those pace steps together and just make sure everything is aligned. Um, so that's that's great that you're able to do that. And I think Shaylin has her hand up as well. Shaylin, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Zahra. Um, something that I found kind of neat um, just because of the pandemic um, is some organizations post on social media about different um, things that can help. Um, so whether that be tools or resources online or a phone number to call, um, checking, like I'll check my financial institution, but then I'll also look at kind of what other financial institutions are saying as well. Um, or I'll look at different youth serving organizations and see what they have to say because sometimes they put really great links um, online as well. Great, thank you, thank you so much for sh sharing, Shailen. Um, so I think that's it for everyone that would like to share out loud right now. Um, so please continue to put your answers, your, your comments into the chat um, so everyone can see kind of what, what you're thinking. Um, and then I am going to move on to my last couple of questions for our panelists. And Tanya, I'm going to start with you. My question for you is how have you been accessing your information about financial well being? And has this changed since more services moved online in the past few months? Um, most of the information that I've been finding about financial, my financial well being has definitely been. Um, online, just researching, looking on the websites of my financial institution and other financial institutions websites, just in general. Um, also their social media pages. And I used to like to go into the branch every so often, but now since most of the branches are closed or there's longer lineups, I just have strictly been doing all my research online. And regarding, um, university and my finances in university i have been asking um students that go to the, my university or um, students in second year and third year about their experience and they've been giving me advice and stuff like that so as well as uh, my university also has some resources for that Great, thank you so much, Tanya. I think, yeah, you mentioned something really important, just talking to other people that have gone through the same experience as you and what advice that they might have. Um, I think they have a lot to offer because of that shared experience, so thank you. And Igul, I'll ask you the next question. Um, and this question is for um, Alicia and Gavin as well, but I'll start with you, Igul. How does your organization share information and how do they access youth? And how have you been changing your services to meet the needs of youth at this time? So as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, tenant courses or courses about uh, renting. And specifically we have a um, 12 hour uh, course uh, which goes through every aspect of renting to make it um, to make it go smooth, starting from applying for housing, uh, communications, budgeting, knowing your rights and responsibilities, knowing how to take care of your place, and um, having good communication skills and how to tackle those uh, difficult conversations, like uh, the question we had about the, uh, the boss. But sometimes you might have to have a difficult conversation with your landlord or with your roommate or your neighbors. So we have this kind of course that we offer as an organization ourselves publicly, but we also train other organizations, many of which are youth serving organizations such as um, the START program, the Y, Y Young's Mom program, Y Pandora Youth Apartments. Um, we've, uh, uh, we've, the past couple of years with generous support from Coast Capital, we have been uh, offering these courses at high schools in the CRD region. Uh, we work with different high schools like uh, Victoria High School, Royal Bay, um, and many others. 
so we're trying to make this information av available as widely as possible and we're supporting any organizations that would like uh, to, tr to uh, make this uh, training available for youth and we're offering it ourselves. We also have the, our online training. It takes, a, a, an, on average, it's an online self-paced course, which has a combination of some videos, um, interactive tools where you enter some information and get some answers, and at the end you get a certificate as well. Um, and currently, because of COVID, we cannot offer in-person courses, so what we do is we have transferred our uh, program into a virtual learning, and it blends uh, elements of the online course together with a Zoom session. So you have an actual facilitator that will answer your questions and you do some fun uh, interactive activities like uh, doing a condition inspection report at your house, trying to find what's wrong with the, um, what are the problems in the house that you can put in a condition inspection report. Um, yeah, and all of this is available for free. Uh, all you need to do is reach out to us and uh, you can email me. Um, I hope we'll be able, at, at the end, we'll be able to provide our emails or just go to our website, brentsmarteducation.org um, and get that information. Um, another resource I would like to recommend, um, it, it's, it's not our organization, but it's something that I, I find myself very useful and a lot of people we talk to find useful, is a website called tenants.bc. Um, it's, um, it's, the organization is called Track, and it provides hard and fast information about tenancy. So if you have a certain problem with your uh, tenancy right now and you want quick answers, you just type in your question and the first thing that comes up in a Google search would probably be that. They just break down the complicated legisla legislation into very short, simple, easy to understand answers and they provide links for further information if you want to dive in deeper into that. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. So if you if you would like to learn more about renting your rights and um, how to succeed in a tenancy, uh, just um, reach out to us and we'll be happy to offer you that information. Thank you so much, Yagul. Um, that's really helpful and you provided some really specific programs too that you offer. And just for participants' um, information, you don't have to memorize everything that was said. We are going to share out these resources um, after uh, the webinar too, so that you have access to everything that's been shared today. So I just want to let that be known. Um, Alicia, I'm gonna move on to you now um, with the same question. How does your organization share information and how do they access youth? And how have you been changing your services to meet the needs of youth at this time? Great questions. Uh, so we share general information about what it is we do and how we do it first and foremost on our website uh, and then amplify it from there on social media. Uh, we use Instagram, which I think is, I don't even know, if, I think that's where the youth are. <laughs> and then Facebook, which we understand youth probably aren't there, so it's mostly for your parents um, and, uh, and Twitter as well. Uh, so those are the three main channels we use um, and those are typically used to amplify uh, programs or opportunities that you can then find out more information about on, on our actual website. Uh, when it comes to sharing information about, you know, with a particular person or, you know, helping them uh, talk about what their options are, talk about their idea, refer them to, to, to ways to help them do that, uh, that primarily comes through in group training programs, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching or one-off uh, workshops. Um, so, uh, and I'd say that's where folks get the most uh, value. Um, and uh, I would add, it, we also, in, we treat our loan application process as a learning uh, process and a learning opportunity. Uh, we're not there to, to, to assess you the second you walk through the door. Uh, so, you know, you can show up with very little information, but a strong idea and we'll, we'll work with you and, and share information about developing a business plan, developing your budget, building out your cash flow, getting really crystal clear on what it is you're trying to do uh, to prepare that application package uh, with absolutely no pressure of actually submitting it. Um, you know, it's as much of, of a success for us if somebody goes through that process, gets crystal clear on what it is they're gonna do uh, and realizes that debt is not the answer right now. And, and um, that's, that's awesome. Um, 
uh, through those conversations, uh, we then share information, uh, you know, that we feel will be supportive uh, from partners in our network. Uh, so we, we are able to, to support folks way beyond what we can specifically offer by connecting to other organizations who do similar things, but maybe a better fit uh, or offer resources that uh, may be a better fit than what we can offer. Uh, so we have, you know, strong relationships with uh, Futurepreneur, Women's Enterprise Center, uh, you know, a, a WAC, a League of Innovators, there's um, Social Enterprise Catalyst, Ground Social, Social Ventures, uh, and, and, you know, we're more interested in, in figuring out the best plan for the individual, uh, the young person, to get what they need to do what they want to do uh, than, than having any ownership over that. So to say, we encourage you to reach out uh, and, and ask for a conversation uh, and then we can see, you know, what we can do from there. Um, when the pandemic hit, we had two programs running and uh, one of them was entirely in person uh, and one was half online, half in person. Uh, and I'd say the, the youth pivoted very well, <laughs> uh, better than some of the facilitators, but we've all caught up with each other now. Uh, and um, so we, uh, you know, all of the fall programs were, will be online. Uh, all of the Ask the Expert sessions are also online. Uh, and all of our one-on-one -on -one consultations are also online. So, um, you know, uh, we, for, and for that we use Zoom, we use Google Suite, <laughs> uh, and we use, um, you know, other uh, platforms. Uh, and then I know what, you know, once I have a relationship with somebody, I mean, we'll text. Text is a common way to, to reach out to folks. And we also appreciate that not everyone has data or access to, to internet in a consistent way. So uh, that's another way we try and be communicative with folks uh, and meeting them where they're at. Um, yeah, in terms of um, changing our services, uh, I mean, a lot of that's still in the works. So I don't, um, I, I'd say all of our, our, all of our programs are offered with context to what it means to build a business in the context of this economy. Uh, and, and both the, the emphasis on doing this in a digital way, so e-commerce, uh, and, um, and any other factors that may impact how somebody plans a business. Um, so that's not specific to youth, but it's, uh, it's, we're trying to connect youth with that information as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Alicia. It sounds like you're really trying to meet um, folks where they're at. So in terms of trying to um, provide services and access youth, uh, you're trying to meet them where they're at, which is which is great. So this is a helpful conversation to to know what that is exactly and how you are doing it and how you can evolve doing that. So thank you. Um, Gavin, I'm going to move on to you now. Okay, so our organization shares information with the public through our social media pages on Twitter and Facebook. Unfortunately, we are not yet on Instagram, but I'm hoping we'll get there soon. Uh, there are lots of resources on those pages, so please check them out. They will be posted in the infographic that's going to be sent out. We also connect with community partners such as schools, the Foundry, youth service providers, including Youth Empowerment Society, Boys and Girls Club, Threshold Housing, Pandora Youth Apartments, uh, the um, Victoria Native Friendship Center. And right now, while I'm not able to visit those places in person, uh, I'm connecting with the staff there and they're sending youth on over to connect with me via the phone, video chat, uh, text message. I'm one of the few people in my organization that can text, so uh, feel free to send me a message because that's a good way to communicate. Uh, I'm also the organization's dedicated youth employment outreach coordinator, so it's basically my job to go out and connect with as many youth and their supports and then help them access our services. So I'm trying to be as many places virtually as possible. That means like a whole bunch of three-way calling and different ways of, of just connecting. If, if somebody's parent or their support worker reaches out, we find a good way to like build a relationship and then support them to come into our service. Uh, I release a youth job blast once per not month, which has hot employment tips, a list of uh, youth friendly employers, and uh, the upcoming WorkBC events that I think would be uh, the most appreciated by youth clients. Uh, our organization has changed our services to offer all of our courses, resources, and webinars online through our Career Connect platform. Uh, it was really good timing. Career Connect launched in February, uh, and it was just like a soft launch, and 
then we just pushed all of our content on it. And so we're creating new things all the time. Just a little sample, there are courses on resumes, interviewing, job search, there's courses on labor market information. So if you're not familiar with labor market information, that's a whole bunch of research on a particular industry. And it's gonna tell you what the employment prospects are. So is that industry in decline? Are there a lot of job openings? What you can expect as your average wage? What kind of training you would need? Who locally might be hiring? And it really can give you a good assessment on whether that career path might be right for you. And, whether there are jobs there and, and what you would be paid in those positions. Um, some of the industries we have profiled are healthcare support roles, uh, the advanced technology industry. I'm not sure if people are aware, but Victoria has like a huge tech industry that's growing quite substantially and I suspect will grow even more with COVID. Um, we also offer interactive group webinars. And one really exciting thing is we've now opened up these interactive group webinars to both our self-serve and case managed clients. So all WorkBC clients can participate in them. Uh, one webinar is our Hired Youth Job Club. So we launched that at the start of June. We play some music, we give away a gift card, we try and have some fun, but we also focus on youth-led topics of research around employment services and we're broadcasting that to five different locations around the province so you get to network with other job seekers around BC. We have a pulling together indigenous youth job or indigenous job club, not just youth, sorry. We have our motivational Monday job club, job club and resume and interviewing creation seminars and these can all be accessed through a laptop, a tablet or even on your mobile phone. If you are gonna use your mobile phone though, I highly recommend you be on Wi-Fi because it will eat up your data. Um, and uh, if you don't have access to technology, one thing that we recently rolled out is that you can actually book an appointment in our office to come in and sign up for our services. Or if you need individual support job searching and you're just not able to do it virtually, you can book an appointment that way. If you want more information, please don't hesitate to give me a call and I can support you there. And uh, I do highly encourage anyone that wants to connect to just send me a text, give me a call or shoot me an email and I will either figure out if our service is right for you or try and find another service that fits. Great, thank you so much, Gavin. That was a lot of information that you just, you shared. Sorry. So thank you, no, it's great, it's great, thank you. Um, so now I, I wanna ask um, participants, are, do you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share out loud? And if so, please raise your hand and we can unmute you. Otherwise, please type your question into our live Q&A um, and we can, we can talk about that. I don't think I see any hands being raised right now. Um, so, so let's move into the next portion of our conversation. It's the last part of the conversation and we're gonna kind of talk about what's next. Um, and again, I'd like to just, you know, keeping in mind this, this topic of what's next and other information that you might need and are still looking for, I'd like to open it up for questions from participants. We want to focus on your questions and your comments for the next um, 15 minutes. So one of the questions that we're going to ask you in our chats is what information and resources are you still looking for? So now's your chance to ask that question of our panelists and see um, what what information they they can share with us. Um, so please raise your hand um, to ask the question out loud or please type it into the Q live Q&A. And also just if you have any other questions or comments that you'd like to make, um, you can do that now and we will try to get through as many of these as we can um, in the next 15 minutes. So I do see a question came in through our live Q&A. Um, and the question is, what advice do you have for youth in marginalized communities 
who are seeking workspaces that are fully accepting of who they are. So for marginalized communities, some examples provided was Two-Spirit, LGBTQ+, Black, Indigenous, people of color, or youth with physical or mental disabilities. So Gavin did um, provide a, a bit of text for that question, but I also just want to open it up to panelists to speak on that, um, that question and see what you might be able to share. Um, I, it's, it's interesting and I, I, I mean, first I would talk to your community and ask who they're working with and what their experience is like. And I'm, and I also assume that those conversations are already happening, but, um, uh, I also appreciate that, you know, as a young person who may identify as, as, uh, as LGBTQ, for example, um, you may still be growing that community, uh, but, uh, the, you know, I encourage you to to keep having those conversations and, and to, to build that community uh, and, and figure out where, where folks are. Uh, I will say, um, I think this very piece, so people who um, may not face equal or be you know, equity in the workplace, um, that's why a lot of folks turn to self-employment, uh, to creating their own conditions of work. Um, Carrie Hill uh, from Deadbeats Food Trucks, I know she, she, she came to us both for a startup uh, loan and a, an expansion loan to uh, to start her food trucks because she wanted to create a workplace where uh, queer youth could feel safe and welcome and and show up as their whole selves uh, and and she's now at a place now like at, at this stage where folks seek her out and say I want to learn how to cook and I and I want to learn how to cook with you because they know they can do that in a in a workplace where they'll be supported so um, this is you know. I, depending on what your your career path is like um uh yeah getting curious and asking asking some questions and and also you know interviewing workplaces <laughs> you know talk to them ask them what they have in place how they enforce it uh i think now more than ever uh this is top of mind for folks and uh and i think a lot of workplaces um are at very different places on their spectrum of, of having plans in place for this and and for creating these safe environments to work um so uh yeah i saw gavin nodding so what do you want to jump in please <laughs> I, I think that's a really great point um oftentimes people forget that in an interview there's power on both sides of the table and, and you are also really assessing an employer to see if that's gonna be a good fit for you. So in an interview, having that conversation and having some of those questions saved for the end would be a really good time to ask. I, I also think finding an inclusive workplace where you're gonna feel valued and you can be yourself is a key part of the job search process. And there are a variety of ways to figure out whether that is gonna be an inclusive work environment. I know recently uh, looking for employers that were friendly to two-spirit LGBTQ plus folks. Uh, I found out about the Facebook group Jobs for Queers and we were able to get like a whole bunch of suggested workplaces that were inclusive and accepting. I also think doing visits to businesses and just kind of like checking them out. Now right now with COVID like maybe not you know, the best thing, but you can even just look outside and kind of get a sense of like who works there. You know, does it look like an environment where you can imagine yourself being? We also, we partner with March of Dimes who provides support to folks with diverse abilities. And we partner with the Intercultural Association and they specialize in finding inclusive workplaces that you are gonna feel comfortable at. And, uh, we are in the process of hiring an Indigenous Employment Outreach Coordinator. Right now, we do get job postings where they, you know, identify that they're looking for somebody who is Indigenous or somebody who comes from a background uh, as a Black person or a person of colour. And those are job postings that we can highlight for you. And we can also help you do research to find those jobs or businesses that might make you, um, yeah, fe feel comfortable and I wish all employers you know were a place that everyone could feel comfortable and I'm hoping the pressure is going to ramp up to to change those work environments and I think the more people that we can 
get employed, the more inclusive we make workplaces. Um, there's also a program called Community that's specifically for Two-Spirit LGBTQ plus folks. And it's a six week paid employment program and it deals with a lot of those issues within the employment program and then helps identify employers that you can be yourself at. And uh, then the Victoria Native Friendship Center also runs a youth empowerment and hospitality program. And I think you would get a similar type of support through them. Thank you so much. Um, Agul or, or Tanya, is there anything you'd like to, to add to this question at all? Um, no, uh, yeah, I think um, there was a lot of helpful information from Gavin and Alicia. Great, yeah, thank you, Alicia and Gavin for, for sharing that. Um, and, and I think, I just want to say as well, I think that, you know, when you, as youth, when you find yourself as a marginalized individual, there will always be people and the dominant society kind of pushing you down and telling you that you can't be the way that you are. Um, and that's so unfortunate. So I just want to, to validate that your experience and who you are and the way that you experience the world and see the world is so, so valid. And what, you know, through that you bring so much into a workplace that the status quo cannot. So who you are and what you experience adds so much. And just, you know, when people are putting you down for that, try to remember that and try to keep that in your mind. And there will be people and there will be a community that does lift you up and support you in that. So yeah, I just wanted to say that so you, you do feel validated and that there are people here that will always validate you. And so we do have some other questions that have come up into uh, our question and answer. Um, so I'm going to ask our panelists all of them too. So one of the questions is, is checkings or savings better for managing my money? Uh, I, I mean, checking and savings, so they're tools, they're containers that you can use to manage the funds that you have. And so it's uh, really the best plan that you have is the one that you'll actually use. I suggest you sit down with uh, your banker or the person at the credit union, your chatting with and uh, set up what your savings goals are. Uh, and I've heard, you know, some people use their savings accounts, they'll have multiple savings accounts uh, that are labeled for, for certain goals. Uh, and they know that, um, you know, with every paycheck, a certain amount goes to those places and it's savings. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's to be uh, saved. Uh, and then they, they only put in the checking account, what is theirs for, for living expenses. Uh, so it's, it's, um, yeah, I'd say both. They can work together. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, best thing to do, sit down and, and have a chat with a financial advisor. Go ahead, Tony. I think, did you unmute yourself? Oh, yeah. Um, I would definitely say that um, there are definitely two different types of accounts. And personally, I use my checking account for day-to-day -day expenses and then my saving account um, to like gain a bit of an interest. But I would definitely um, say to speak, to, with, speak with someone at your financial institution and they will definitely be able to help you with that. Great, thank, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, okay, so another question that we have in our live Q&A is, how long should I wait to hear back from an interviewer? What do I do if I have not heard back in a while? I would recommend waiting maybe three, four days, perhaps a week at most, uh, but I definitely recommend calling or emailing and following up. It shows that you're persistent and committed to the job. 
even if you didn't get the job, which I hope isn't the case, it allows you to ask questions on what you might be able to do differently next time to improve. And actually, I'll tell you, in this job right now, when I interviewed, I didn't get it. I was the runner up and it was a little bit defeating, but I asked some questions of what I could do to improve and kind of affirm my commitment to working for the agency and my interest. And then a year later, that person left the job and they contacted me and I ended up going through the process again. And I used some of the information that they gave me the first time to my advantage to be more prepared for that interview. So I highly recommend doing that. Um, you also could even ask if there are other positions available because when you think of that hidden job market, sometimes there are jobs that haven't been posted yet that you can actually poach and get to before they even get out there. Because maybe you were their second choice or third choice, but they haven't quite connected the dots that you might be interested in a different position. So by being friendly, by coming well prepared with maybe your resume down so you could remind them of a couple of your key qualities. It's a really good way to engage them and show that you're not afraid and you really want that position. That's really insightful. Thank you, Gavin. And I see Alicia, you've uh, unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, we're going through a hiring process right now. And, you know, if, if they don't give you a timeline, if you're at the interview process and you're still waiting, you know, you're wondering when you're going to hear back, uh, ask them, you know, um, to get a sense of the timeline as well. They may not have one yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and just on the topic of interviewing, it came up in a, in a typed out answer. Um, but uh, interview for jobs, apply for jobs you may not feel 100% qualified for yet. Uh, it's it's like like Gavin said, you know, he learned through that process. He learned about the organization, the institution, uh, and benefited from it. So um, you know, don't uh, don't don't be shy. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, rejection stings, but it, you know, ultimately you'll go from that as well. Um, I'd like to share a bit from my personal experience as well. Um, I haven't, like where I work right now, I haven't heard back soon enough from them. And so I was, I was kind of sure that I didn't get the job. And then I, uh, as I was looking, I started looking for other things, uh, for other opportunities, but I really wanted this job. So I reached back. I reached out back to the interviewer and I asked, I, uh, I uh, asked them whether, you know, are, are they still considering me? Should I look for other options? And then I was surprised to hear that they had some kind of internal process that, um, because all my references were actually outside of Canada. So they had to develop a different kind of process, which does not use the phone. So um, I ended up getting the job. So I uh, encourage, even if you think that um, it's been a while and you haven't heard, just to reach out won't hurt to ask whether you know, you're still being considered or not. Great, thank you. Thank you all for that insight. Really, really helpful. Um, so another question that we have is, are there any programs or help for individuals that are in need of finding accommodation within their budget? So I might go to, uh, to you, Agul, to, to answer that question. Yeah, that's, that's a good question and a difficult question too, because we live in a very complex rental market and rent is really high here, like really high. So, um, what we offer in our courses is uh, basic things like understanding affordability, uh, whether what, what, what type of housing or how much uh, you can afford to pay for rent, depending on what your income is. So we uh, do those kind of basic calculations and also figuring out ways to either cut costs or save money on rent, either be it uh, roommate situations or found finding social housing or co-op housing and, um, you know, exploring other ways to find, to be able to afford your housing. But unfortunately, we do live in a very complex rental market and uh, finding affordable housing is not an easy 
task in itself. Thank you, Agul. I think this kind of um, relates to a question that I have for you, Tanya. You mentioned that you are going to start um, at U of T in the fall as a student. So kind of about your living situation, how will you decide, how will you make a decision about where to live in the fall and what financial considerations will you keep in mind? Um, yeah, so the few options that I have right now is whether I will move to Toronto and live on residence or whether I will live off campus in an apartment. Um, and then another option, which is the most likely option is just staying in Victoria and doing um, school online because um, there's a lot of opportunity for that due to the pandemic. Um, so some financial considerations would definitely be um, residents, like the cost for residents or living in an apartment um, compared to just staying with my parents for a couple more months. And then as well as tuition, I will have to figure out how to pay for tuition. Um, and if I work from Victoria, then that allows me to just keep my job that I have now rather than having to find another job when I, if I move to Toronto. Um, and then cost for food, entertainment, just day-to-day -day expenses, and if I'm living off of residence in Toronto, utility bills and stuff like that. So there's a lot to take into account. And then some things that aren't financial, um, things that I'm taking into consideration are just comfort, comfort and um, my support system. If I stay here, I'll be surrounded by my family and my friends. Um, but if I go and to Toronto, then I'll have to create a whole new support system. Thank you, Tanya, for sharing. Um, and thanks for sharing some of those other non-financial considerations too. Um, you know, we can't really talk about the finance and isolation that that other part of well-being um, is linked to and is very important. So. Good luck on your journey figuring all of that out, but I think uh, I think you're you'll you'll be great. Um, so another question I have for for those uh, for Gavin and Igul and Alicia are: What steps would you like to take? Or sorry, this is the wrong question that I'm asking. <laughs> The question that I have is how do you envision yourself and your organization supporting youth and their financial well-being going forward, especially during COVID? And I will ask Gavin to jump in. First, we're just going to keep creating youth-friendly content. Uh, I really want to figure out how to do a youth job fair. Uh, right as COVID shut down WorkBC, I was supposed to have a huge youth job fair, and it was really disappointing that it didn't happen. So I want to host another youth job fair as soon as I get management approval, and then just creating other programming that focuses on youth topics of interest in terms of employment services, finding ways to connect youth with as many resources as possible and job opportunities that are gonna help them not only cover their bills now, but launch them on a career path of meaningful employment. It's one thing to you know, get financial remuneration, but it's a whole another thing to feel good about your job. And yes, you need to cover your financial side of your life, but to feel good about the work that you're doing is just, if not more valuable. Um, and yeah, then just trying to find innovative ways to engage folks. I recognize it's hard to be on video chat or to conference call and you know to laugh at the ridiculousness of it a bit and try and find ways whether that's like DJing music or giving away a gift card that we can make it fun and uh, not all just learning. Great, thank, thanks Gavin. Um, and I think I'll just ask you Alicia if you have any uh, thing to share on that um, before we kind of go into our closing. Absolutely, um, I'm, I think Number one will be listening to what youth 
uh, what questions they're asking, where they're at, what their concerns are, what it is they're trying to do to support their financial well-being in this context. And so I'm really looking forward to the youth uh, entrepreneurship training programs coming up in the fall. Uh, you know, we have a curriculum, but from day one, I'm, I'm there and uh, you know, doing, we're doing our best to, to meet folks where they're at and co-create something that will actually bring value to, to what it is they're trying to do and the questions that they're asking and, and the gaps in knowledge that they have and the skills they already have. Uh, I learn as much from, from the young people I work with as, as I can offer them. So I think that will be in hyper mode <laughs> in the fall. Um, and, you know, I, and so I'm grateful for conversations like this. I, um, and I encourage folks, if you did not feel comfortable to to engage in, in this particular conversation to, you know, maybe come back next week or reach out to us and, and ask your questions because that's, uh, you know, you're helping us by asking questions. You're helping us by asking for, you know, referrals to more information. Like it is a gift uh, and not to sound like it's a gift, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's at the core of what we do is, is trying to support folks. So, um, uh, yeah, and then, you know, from that, um, seeing, um, just being continuously aware of, of where the gaps are um, from the second, the, the, the pandemic economic impacts set in, uh, our team set out to close the, the gaps in the net of support. And so we've been keeping a very close eye on where programs or supports or, you know, whatever it is, interventions are, are not quite uh, meeting the needs of young people um, and the unique challenges that you all face. So, uh, and then figuring out what we can do uh, to either fill that gap directly or convene the folks who, who have a chance to, to actually respond uh, quickly and innovatively. Um, you know, that's uh, the silver lining of all of this is that uh, uh, the space for, for responding uh, to, to what is needed out there is, is um, Far more open than it's been than it was before this so um yeah i you know i look forward to to, to next week's conversation as well and, and just keeping an ear out great thank thank you so much alicia and thank you um to gavin and Agul and tanya too and to all of our participants for that very informative and engaging conversation um I think we we all learned a lot and we still have a lot to think about. Um, but but now we have some time to reflect on what we've heard in the past hour and a half. And I mentioned that Shaylin and Divyesh have been taking notes on key takeaways and some of the next steps. So we are going to share what they've captured. Um, and I will actually ask Shaylin to, to share first if you are ready, Shaylin. Thank you, Zahara. Uh, I wanted to take a moment first to thank the panelists, the Victoria Foundation and Coast Capital for hosting this conversation. Really appreciative of all of the tools and resources that I've been hearing about. Um, I think some of the biggest takeaways that I took um, was something that Alicia said that I really liked. It was just like so plain and simple. Alicia, you, you just said, get curious. And I think that being part of this conversation today is like the first step to that. You signed up for this webinar. You were curious about learning more about your financial well-being, whether you were in a situation like one of T Tanya's friends where you don't even have a bank account, or maybe you're in a situation like Gavin where you're like struggling a little bit and you want to find your way out of it. Um, being part of these conversations is a great place um, to be, whether you're just starting out and dipping your toe in or whether you want to like dive right into it. Um, I also um, picked up as a takeaway, like leaning into this discomfort that you might feel around your financial well-being. Um, I think sometimes um, you might feel your own stress around your financial well-being. Maybe there's someone in your life um, who is having challenges with their financial well-being and recognizing and owning the fact that those can be difficult conversations is important, especially in the middle of a global pandemic where there's a lot more disruptions than there might usually be. Um, and taking ownership for that um, and being able to recognize where you're at um, is really important. Um, so those are my takeaways and I invite um, Divyesh to share it back as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shailen. Um, I think you, you shared some really great points with us and now, Divyesh, I see that you're ready, so please, please go ahead. 
Hello, everyone. Um, Shailen did an excellent job of summarizing, so I'm just going to wrap up things by echoing some of the points that we discussed today that really resonated with me personally. Uh, with regard to financial well-being, it's essential to take action now. Become comfortable with money and take on an active relationship with it so that you yourself can be in control of your financial decisions early on. Debt can easily become a lifelong struggle, so if you can put the principles of budgeting and saving in action early, you'll have more time to accumulate money and do what you want with it. Egul also made an important note with the link between finance and mental health. You don't want your financial concerns to become a burden for your health at the level of your mind. As Gavin mentioned earlier today, make a plan to avoid being overwhelmed. Don't be afraid to ask people you trust to help you with this. Like Shaylin, I also really appreciated Alicia's two key points of being curious and not selling yourself short. We all have the capacity to learn and try new things, so it's important to take advantage of the educational opportunities that organizations like WorkBC, RentSmart, and Community Microlending offer. Also, despite what we may think, we already possess many of the skills that are required to be successful in a given workplace. As Tanya touched on, never underestimate the amount of finance-related information that is available online. Especially in the wake of this pandemic, many organizations have digitized further and there's more information available online now more than there has ever been. Remember that many of your questions can be answered efficiently through a simple search as opposed to searching for someone in person to talk to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Divyash. That was, that was really well said and I think you've summarized a lot of important points throughout the conversation and, and just such a very thorough um, and easy to understand way. So thank you for that. And thank you, Shaylin, as well for sharing your thoughts. Um, very, so thoughtful and so helpful. So with that, um, I want to kind of pivot our attention uh, for, for, a, for a minute or so. We are going to put up some poll questions um, and I'd ask all participants to just answer those poll questions um, that have just opened up or will shortly open up. Um, and yeah, there they are. So please answer those questions. And, and as folks are answering those questions, um, I'd just like to mention that, that for your information, we will be working on a report and an infographic to thoroughly capture what we've learned from our conversation today. Um, and so, so please keep an eye out for that. We'll send it all to your email once we have it ready. And in addition to that, we'll also be um, including just what panelists have mentioned in terms of websites and resources so that you have that on hand too. And like we said, this webinar was recorded, so the video will be posted on YouTube and on the Victoria Foundation's website when it's ready. So if you do want to come back to this conversation, you definitely can uh, open, open to you to, to go back and take in these words again. All right, so now I'd like to pass things over to Tanya, who's the Manager of Community Investment at Coast Capital Savings, um, and she'll just share a few words. Please go ahead, Tanya. Thank you so much, Sahara. I wanted to start off by just really um, being in a place of gratitude to the uh, Victoria Foundation, uh, especially Rob and Tracy and yourself, I think really the entire team for making space for this conversation. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Youth Advisory Committee who worked so hard to pull this together. I know it's not, um, it, it's been a lot of twists and turns as things have been changing. And so I really appreciate your time. This really truly has been youth led, youth voice. And that really is a gift, at least yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It is a gift for us to be able to understand what youth care about. And so this is very important for us. And I'd like to thank the panelists for guiding the conversation and for your honesty, especially as we kicked off this conversation. Um, being honest about your own financial uh, journey is, uh, is something that a lot of people will not share. So to start off with that level of honesty was really fantastic. At Coast Capital, uh, each year we allocate 10% of our bottom line to programs and initiatives that empower youth on their journey to financial independence. And I think what we've heard today, and I think this was really had been my hope when we had envisioned this conversation, was that we really are not talking about 
you know, long-term good savings habits and money discipline. And those are tools for sure. But what we ended up, what I ended up hearing in this conversation is exactly what we talk about a lot uh, at Coast, which is about beliefs and values and mental health and how having a financial well-being really leads to freedom. And ultimately, the, the, the big dream is to be able to empower youth to create change, to be the change makers of tomorrow. We know, we understand that you have ideas about what the future will look like. And with financial well-being and financial freedom, you'll be able to act on those ideas. And so really, that was it, what it was about. And that's what I was hearing a lot in this conversation. So uh, I'm so glad that the conversation was centered around that idea. Um, so really, I just I just wanted to say thank you. Our, our partnership with the Victoria Foundation is a very important one to us. Uh, the vital conversation and vital signs is very important to us. And, and thank you for allowing us to be your partner. Thank you so much, Tanya. Those are really beautiful words and what a way to, to close this event. Um, very inspiring. So this does bring us to the end of our conversation. I'd like to take just a moment to thank our wonderful panelists. We have Ikuel, Alicia, Gavin, and Tanya, who have really been honest and shared with us so much amazing insight. Um, and for participants, I'd like you to just remember that Igul, Alicia, and Gavin, they work for some really great local community-based organizations, and they have incredible supports and information for you. So remember that these individuals and these organizations are ones that you can reach out to, and we will be providing that information so, so you can do that. In addition, thanks again to Coast Capital, to our amazing youth advisory, and most of all to you, our participants, for joining us today. Together, I think we've created some very important dialogue about money and financial well-being, and I am personally very grateful to have been a part of it. So let's remember to just keep it going and not let it stop here. I hope all of you have a wonderful night. Thank you again so much for joining us.